Hi, my name is Michael Gattoletto from Georgia Tech. I'm reviewing a paper by Ramachandran and Herstein called The Science of Art, A Neurological Theory of Aesthetic Experience. Following the author's introduction to the arts, they reveal their simplified approach. They begin by simply making a list of all those attributes of pictures that people generally find attractive. They call this list the Eight Laws of Artistic Experience. It is a set of guidelines that artists consciously or unconsciously utilize to optimally engage the visual areas of the brain. Additionally, because viewer act viewers actively recreate art when they are viewing it, they are also artists in this sense. The first principle to consider is called the peak shift effect, which is typically known in uh, animal discri discrimination learning. For instance, let's say a rat is taught to discriminate the difference between a square and a rectangle. Every time it finds a rectangle, it gets a reward. Soon, the rat will learn to respond more frequently to the rectangle than the square. Eventually, the rat will respond even more to a rectangle that is skinnier and longer. This curious result implies that the rat is learning, not a prototype, but a rule. The rat is capturing the very essence of the rectangle in order to evoke a direct emotional response. What an artist tries to do is not only capture the essence of something, but also to amplify it in order to more powerfully activate the same neural mechanisms that would be activated by the original object. Therefore, the artist highlights it an object's essential features and disregards irrelevant information. For example, consider the way in which a cartoonist would draw a famous face, in this case Nixon. What do we do? He would start with Nixon's face. From there, he would take the averages of all the other faces and subtract this from Nixon's face, therefore getting the difference between Nixon's face and all the others. Then he amplifies these differences. The final result is a drawing that is even more Nixon-like than the original. This result is the same as the skinnier rectangle and the original square. The results of these ampli amplifications is a super stimulus, which the, the viewer responds more to than the original drawing itself. The second principle is that of isolation. It addresses the need to isolate a single visual modality before amplifying it. This is why an outline drawing or a sketch is more effective as art than a full color photograph. Isolating a single area allows one to direct attention more effectively to this one source of information, thereby allowing you to notice the enhancements introduced by the artist. The reinforcement produced by those enhancements activates the limbic system in the brain more effectively. Consider our Nixon example again. The image on the left is a full color illustration of Nixon. However, what is unique about Nixon is the form of his face, not the skin tone. Even though it makes the picture look more human-like, it doesn't contribute to making Nixon look like himself. Therefore, it actually detracts from the efficiency of the form cues. This is why one would predict a full color photo of Nixon would be actually less aesthetically pleasing than the sketchy outline to the right. The third principle pre presented is grouping. The process of discovering correlations of features to recognize separate identities or events must be reinforcing for their organism in order to provide them incentive to do so. Please note the picture provided. It is originally seen as a group of black and white splotches. However, after staring for a while, you may be able to recognize that a group of these spl splotches can be linked to form the image of a dog. Indeed, the discovery of the dog and the linking of the dog relevant splotches generates a, a pleasant aha sensation. It forces you to hold on to th these groups of linked splotches. The purpose of this is for the organism to be able to pick out the figure from the noise in the environment. The viewer is allowed to to defeat camouflage. This may be accomplished due to limbic reinforcement that is not only fed back to early vision once the object has been completely identified, but is evoked at each and every stage in the processing. So as soon as grouping is achieved, the organism recognizes it as its own identity. 
This is what causes you to hold on to the object. The key idea here is, given the limited attentional resources in the brain and the limited neural space for competing representations, at every stage in processing, your brain is telling you, look here, here's a clue, here's something that you should take note of. Though not spontaneous, this reinforcement is the source of the pleasant sensations. The fourth concept also has to do with reinforcement and involves disregarding redundant information and extracting contrast. Cells in the retina, lateral geniculate body, and the visual cortex respond mainly to edges or step changes in luminance, but not to homogeneous surface colors. So for instance, the gradients are much easier to see in the bottom image than on the top. Such contrasts may be intrinsically pleasing to the eye. The allocation of attention is the reason why this process is rewarding to the organism. Evolutionary, the attention grabbing effects of contrast must be very important in nature since it is often used to camouflage predators and their prey. The fifth law is the most obvious. Unsurprisingly, symmetry is aesthetically pleasing. This may be because most biologically important objects are symmetrical. For instance, when choosing a mate, animals and humans prefer symmetry. Evolutionary biologists have argued that this is because asymmetrical organisms are often suffering from disease or some type of parasitic infection. The sixth law is the generic viewpoint principle and the in the Bayesian logic of perception. This refers to the fact that the visual system hates interpretations which rely on a unique vantage point and favors generic ones. For instance, it is easy to see that the figure on the left is a cube from a generic vantage point. However, most people see the image as a on the right as a flat hexagon with spokes radiating from the middle. However, this is also a cube, but only a single unique vantage point could produce such a retinal image. Therefore, if an artist is trying to please the eye, he too should avoid such coincidences. However, sometimes a pleasing effect can be produced by violating this principle rather than adhering to it. The seventh law is perceptual problem solving. This refers to when an object discovered after a struggle is more pleasing than one that is instantly obvious. Thus, it makes the image more alluring. The reason for this is not sure, but perhaps a mechanism of this kind ensures that the struggle itself is reinforcing so that you don't give up too easily, similarly as discussed when referring to contrast and grouping. It is easy to see how this applies to the image of the leopard. The last law is art as a metaphor. A metaphor is a mental tunnel between two concepts that appear very dissimilar at first. Ramakandran uses the example of Shakespeare when he says Juliet is the sun. These seem very different, however they share radiance and warmth. The discovery of similarities and the link of superficially dissimilar events will lead to a limbic system activation in order to ensure that the process is rewarding. Overall, the authors have a strong ability to define elements of the human perception in co concrete terms. I feel that their laws are well justified with their examples provided, however they are not backed by experimental data. Ramakandran does suggest, however, a method to study the peak shift principle using galvanic skin response. He suggests that this is a better measure than simply asking someone how much emotion he or she feels when they are looking at something because the verbal response is filtered. By having more quantitative experiments like this, it is hoped that specific brain areas responsible in viewing art can be identified using functional imaging. However, one potential ex objection that still exists is that the originality is the essence of art and that the laws do not capture this.